The title of this morning's message is this, Essential or Non-Essential? That's a great title, isn't it, considering what we've just gone through and how people like to define things, essential and non-essential. Don't worry, we're not going to talk any about that junk, but uh, that's the title, Essential or Non-Essential? We'll see why in a moment. Let me ask you this, okay? If I were to ask you, what is the most important thing you need to do in order to, uh, to stay alive? In other words, what is the most essential thing, most essential thing for you to do to stay alive? And some of you look at me right now, you're saying, drink coffee, amen, and uh, no, that's wrong. Maybe Dr. Pe- no, just kidding, not that either, no. Well, uh, how, what would you say, you know, in response, uh, again, to that question, someone were to ask you, well, what is the most essential thing for you to just say a lot? Obviously, some would say, okay, I, I need to breathe, and, and that's a great answer, certainly probably one of the best, if not the bre- best. We know it's great advice to not hold your breath too long, Amen. Because that does have an effect on whether you stay alive. We got that. Number two, some would say, hey, drinking water and or fluids, and we could even substitute that. But drinking fluids, drinking water, and eating food, that is, that is essential. And that, that's a good a- a- answer. I mean, obviously, you can last a little bit longer uh, than when you stop breathing. But eating and drinking are super important. You won't live long without them. We know that. Even science tells us that. Some might say, you know, Pastor, it may not be like breathing and such, but, you know, exercise is important. Exercise, and that's true. It really is, though it would take some time. The reality is this. If you didn't move, if you didn't get some exercise and exercise your muscles and things, you would go through atrophy, and uh, it would affect your very life. Organs and muscles and everything else would slowly start to shut down. So you do need exercise. It would... uh, It would cause an end to your life sooner than normally would. You'd certainly be very unhealthy, okay? Now, those might be the top three. You may come up with one that you would interject uh, above one of those. But um, those are certainly viable answers to that question. Well, I'll I'll tell you, I, I don't have statistics on this. But I would venture a guess that the overwhelming majority of living Americans, maybe even all of them, breathe every day. Now, if you need statistics later, I might be able to find that, okay? But most living Americans, I can safely say they, they breathe every day, okay? And I know for some of you, it's still a little bit uh, uh, suspicious. That may not be correct because I stated it, but it is, I believe, okay? So secondly, I would also say this. I also believe the overwhelming majority of Americans who are alive and who have stayed alive for a considerable amount of time also drink water and and eat food, or drink fluids, and eat food. Again, I don't have statistics on it, but I trust you'll believe me on that too, okay? They live for any period of time, or if they are healthy, uh, uh, certainly they've had to have eaten. Now, I do have statistics on the last one. I know you're waiting for this. You see, uh, 2018, the CDC identified through multiple uh, surveys that only 23% of Americans got the needed amount of daily exercise. Now, let's have a hand right. No, we won't do that. Okay. The Cleveland Clinic also came out and confirmed that through some surveys that they had said. They, they said about 80% of Americans don't get enough exercise. Now, exercise certainly is essential. It's vital. It's necessary for being healthy and for the long-term living and staying alive. Yes, it is. But, but it, and it would be a, a mistake to describe exercise as non-essential. But here's the problem. It's deceptive. Because if you don't exercise today, you're probably not really even going to notice today. Maybe even for days or weeks. It's, it's not going like, to be like, oh no, I didn't exercise. Oh, no. no, that's not going to happen. Now, I will say this. If you don't breathe today, you're probably going to notice. True? Yeah, that's fair. If you don't eat today, if you don't drink fluids and water, the reality is you will probably, at least by the end of the day, it's not like breathing, certainly, but by the end of the day, you'll probably notice it. Some of us, our blood sugar would go down, wouldn't it? You'd not have any energy. You'd feel sick to your stomach, possibly. And so even that, that daily eating of food and drinking, you, you'll notice it. And uh, there's times that all of us will go, oh, man, I didn't eat today. You know, you, you ever been so busy where you skipped a meal or two and so forth? And then at some point, you're like, man, my stomach, well, I don't feel, wait a minute, I didn't eat today. And so your body's going to tell you it will grab your attention, maybe with hunger pains or lack of energy or your blood uh, sugar level dropping. You, you're going to notice that you didn't do that. Now, listen to me, and here's the point of all of that. I would submit to you this morning that most believers, Christians, 
those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ for salvation would say that studying their Bible, reading in it regular, daily, is important. It's necessary. It's even vital for a healthy spiritual life. Mostly, they would say it is essential. Now, let me stop there. If you say here, well, Pastor Henry, I, I just don't think Bible reading is that essential for a Christian. Well, let me challenge you to start right there because you need to understand something. If you are a child of the Lord, a disciple of Jesus Christ, you need Christ's words every day. You, you need to know your, what your master says every day. You, you need to be in God's word daily. You say, well, Pastor Henry, listen, hey, I'm here. Sunday morning, May 2nd, if I'm not mistaken on the date. Okay, I am in, I'm in church. I am under the word of God. Well, that's wonderful. And I, I, I appreciate that and I encourage you in that. And I believe God is pleased with that because here's the truth. God has made it clear in his word that he wants you consistently under the preaching and teaching of the word of God. But he also wants you in it. Not just under it, but in it. You personally. It's good. It's good to be under the preaching of the Word of God. But you know, that should be a stimulus, not a substitute for getting into it yourself. God's Word and being under the preaching and teaching, important, biblical. We are supposed to do it as believers. But the fact is, it is not a substitute for personally, daily being in the Word of God. The above illustration that I share, the earlier illustration, I believe most Christians and believers don't miss this. I believe they treat the personal study, the Bible reading, the study of God's Word as spiritual exercise, now don't miss it, rather than spiritual eating and drinking. We treat it like exercise. Okay, you know, if I go a day or two without, it's not that big of a deal. If I go a week, and if I just do it periodically, I don't get enough, but I get maybe just a little bit once a week, once a month, and I'm okay. That'll do it. We treat the Bible study, the reading of God's Word, and young people, teenagers, listen to me. The right path is found in the pages of God's Word. So if you're not in it, if you're not daily saturating yourself with it, young people, listen, you're going to run into a muck of trouble. And so often, so often I've counseled so many people, young and old alike, who have reached problems in their life. Sin has been produced. Things have happened. And I sit down and say, hey, hey, are you having daily devotions? And more often, in fact, I would say 95% of this time, no. I've stopped. I used to. I did at one point. But not right now. We'll see in this message and one follow-up one how vital uh, the study of God's word is. And I would say, though, our lack of doing so often flows from you and I viewing it more like spiritual exercise than the spiritual life-sustaining and life-giving eating of spiritual food. You see, our actions, though we might say, Oh yeah, I believe studying God's word and reading is so essential. Our actions render Bible study as non-essential instead of essential. And again, as I like to do, I have some statistics to support that hypothesis. 2019, uh, Lifeway Research did a poll. Barna Groups has done it on a daily basis from all of America, but this is just the Protestants, those who claim to be Christians. Okay? I know that's a wide swath, uh, but nonetheless, I think it gives us a glimpse. They, they took a poll about people's interaction, they called it, with the Bible. How often they interact with God's Word and reading it, studying it, whatever the case may be. Uh, they, they took a poll. Interestingly from that, 32% said they read God's Word every day. Now, that's good, but it ain't good enough, friend. If you claim to be a Christian, you ought to be in it frequently. 27% said that they read it just a couple times a week. Again, put those two together, that's not terrible. But if something's essential, let me ask you this. Did that same 27% said they only ate a couple times a week? 
Now, they may have exercised, <laughs> or for some of them, that may have been more, <laughs> uh, they didn't. But nonetheless, hey, let's put it into terms, biblical terms, because Bible reading, and we've got to wrap our minds biblically around this truth, Bible reading, the study of God's word, hearing from my Savior, my God, is essential, daily essential. And so if we put this and look at these statistics in light of it, like, wait a minute, how are these people being healthy spiritually? How are they living spiritually? They're on life support, spiritually speaking. It gets worse. 12% said they read the Bible once a week. 11% said they read the Bible just a few times a month. 5% said they read it once a month. 12% of so-called Christians claiming said they rarely read it or never. 12%. Shocks me, disappoints me. But that was in 2019. The Barna Group and uh, just did a survey about the percentage of Americans who read their Bible through the pandemic. This was just a, a few months ago, and uh, they, they said from Americans. Now, this is Americans, not Protestants, but not Christians necessarily. But Americans, it dropped from 14% to 9%. Now, now think about that. This was during the pandemic when half of the United States was locked down. Don't you think more people had more time to do it? But they didn't. 14 to 9% now said, don't read the Bible anymore. That's pretty amazing to me. We can safely say that that 32% is probably not accurate. It's likely lower even today among Christians, given the last couple statistics. So here's the question. Let me ask you this real quick. In application, where do you fall? Which group do you find yourself? How do you view the Bible when its study needs, the, the vitalness, the importance? Is it essential or is it non-essential? Yesterday, Saturday, did you read your Bible? Friday, did you study God's Word? Was it essential or non-essential? Don't, don't just tell me what you want to say. What do your actions say? If you don't read it daily... You say, Pastor Henry, I just don't, I, I just don't read it daily. I, I maybe a couple times a week or maybe once a week or a couple times a month. And what's your reason for doing so? There's a book that has been a blessing to me for many years, and I have used much of that book even in preparation of this sermon. And it gives the following reasons that many people give, even Christians, for not spending time in the Bible regularly. Here is his list of 10 or 11 things. Number one, the Bible doesn't seem relevant to life. Number two, the Bible seems confusing and hard to understand. I, I don't know how to make sense of it. Number three, I, I used to read the Bible and it made me feel good. But after a while, it didn't seem to have the same impact. So I finally just stopped. Number four, I feel guilty when I read the Bible. To that one, I say join the club, amen. It is convicting. Number five, the Bible is hopelessly out of date. It may have some interesting stories, but it has little significance for life today. Number six, I, I rely on my pastor and Sunday school teacher to explain the Bible to me. If I need to know something, they will tell me about it. Number seven, I have doubts about the Bible's reliability. Number eight, and I would say that I find this probably to be the threat to most believers. I don't have time. I'm just too busy. Number nine, young people, sometimes you'll want to throw this up as your reason, an excuse for not reading the Bible. Number nine, the Bible seems boring to me. Number ten, the Bible is full of myths and half-truths. Why study something that lacks credibility? And then number eleven, I don't read, period. It's not just the Bible. I don't read anything. Let me ask you. Why can't we settle for these excuses as believers? Why must we say, no, 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 wait a second. The Bible reading, the study of God's word, it has to be essential. It cannot be non-essential in my life. It must be viewed in my mind, in my heart, my attitude toward it must be that this is, this is essential, spiritual eating and drinking. Something that we can't go without. And readily admitting it won't threaten it or it will threaten the vitality of our spiritual life it will cause me to be very unhealthy why must we have that attitude in that view of bible reading well the bible answers these questions and in doing so it it makes it clear that bible reading bible studying is not just for a special group of believers it's for every believer 
Look with me, if you will, 1 Peter chapter number 2 and verse 2. We'll just focus on this passage, a powerful passage, I think direct in its statement, and so we'll kind of center in on it today, uh, this morning. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, Peter is writing, and he's speaking to believers, and he starts out with an unusual kind of statement here. He says this, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby, okay? Point number one, and frankly, the only point for this morning, okay, as far as main point. Number one, Bible study is necessary for spiritual growth, okay? Bible study is necessary for spiritual growth. I like how many different authors have broken down this verse. It's very simple, and I like it, so I'm gonna use it. The first is this. It's down to three words. The first word is this, and don't miss it. This is easy to remember, something easy to write in the margin of your Bible. The first word is this, attitude. Attitude, okay? Attitude. What is the attitude that Peter is recommending here? Well, the first three words tells us. As newborn babes. So your attitude needs to be like a newborn babe, specifically in how a newborn baby uh, displays uh, that attitude towards milk. Now, we've had the, the blessing the last uh, six months or so of many, many babies being born right here. Have you ever watched a newborn baby and how all of a sudden mom or, or dad, uh, it's a bottle, dad, and how all of a sudden when baby knows it's feeding time and they see the bottle or they see mom, can I tell you, have you ever seen that baby's eyes go poop? And boy, tracks mom or tracks the bottle. And boy, they are all about that. And in fact, it is a, what I would describe a very intense, I've got to have it. I remember there were times uh, where we would have to use formula because of circumstances or whatever the case might be. And I remember when uh, I'd get the bottle and the, the water and start shaking it up. I remember holding a baby as I was trying to shake and the baby grab it. I'd let go, it's not ready yet. And you're shaking, trying to get it all mixed up. And boy, they're grabbing. They're just, I mean, that is their attitude. Give it to me, give it to me, give it to me. I want it right now, right now, right now. And literally, I remember a couple of our boys, like, it belongs to me. And man, when they get the bottle, they ain't taking it back. You can't get it back. There's no taking it back. I mean, they, that is their attitude. They're like, oh, it, I want it. I've got to have it. Those of you who have babies at home, you have my prayers. Because they have a natural built-in alarm that goes off every three to four hours, amen? And if you don't answer the alarm, it's about impossible to, amen? That alarm only gets louder. I hate those kinds of alarms. And you don't shut them off. They just get louder and louder and louder. You can't ignore it. And, and, and I personally, my, I, I, there is no cry like a newborn baby cry. And boy, when a newborn baby wants milk, wants to be fed, whoo, there's no cry like it, I don't think. Have you ever been, like I have, have you ever been given the task of burping a baby? It's eating, you're maybe feeding, you're like, uh-oh, I can, you can feel the, the bubbles and, and so forth. You can tell, uh-oh, it's not going down, so you need to burp it. Have you ever done that to a baby that doesn't want to give up the bottle? It's like a tug of war. Give me that. You're trying to burp them, and you're fighting with it. Why? Because, man, the attitude is, i got to have it. I, I, I want this. This is what I want. I, this is essential. Now, isn't it interesting Peter says what? That ought to be our attitude towards God's word. As newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word. Ain't no one of you say, no, nah, Pastor Andy, I don't think you're right. I've been around babies my whole life, and they just don't really care for it. Come on. And Peter says to you and I, here it ought to be our attitude. Now, you tell me. Can you put a bottle in front of a, ba a hungry baby and it not react? Or show mom if it's still nursing? Uh, put mom around that baby. I remember there's times when, when we were still nursing and, and Erica couldn't walk in the room because it wasn't feeding time because the baby would go crazy. You remember those days? And so poor dad had to deal with a fussy baby, amen? Listen to me. Hey, this is what Peter's describing. And yet what happens? You and I at our house for the week, for a couple days, the Bible just sits there. We walk by. We don't, we don't long for it. We don't desire it. We don't, well, there's not, oh, there's my Bible. Oh, I got this to do. I got to go take care of this. I, I've got to do that. And we walk by it. I'll tell you, a newborn baby that's hungry cannot walk by a Bible. Number one, they can't walk. But anyway, the illustration is there. 
Okay? They're not going to pass the bottle. They're going to scream and yell for it. I've got to have it. I need that. I want it. It's essential. Let me ask you right now today, is God's word essential to you? Is that your attitude? Do you say, hey, man, every day I've got to find myself in it. I'm not talking hours on end. I'm just asking you, do you yearn for it? Do you desire it? Do you have the attitude like a newborn baby? I've got to have it. Don't keep it away from me. Ain't nothing going to get in the way. When I want it, I want it. I've often thought that when it comes to the life of a believer, reading and praying are about the only two things you and I should ever be selfish on. I'm sorry, I can't do that right now. I, I need to get in God's Word. I'm sorry, I, I, can't, I can't go there because I, I need to spend some time in prayer. I, I need to spend some time with my Savior. I, I, I'm sorry, that, that, that can't take priority. This is priority. Someone ever accuses you of being selfish because you want to read God's word or prayer, pray, let them accuse you of being selfish. Because my friend, there are needful things. There are essential things. Do you have this attitude when it comes to reading the Bible and studying it? You ought to. Young person, listen to me. You'll never, you'll never grow into what you ought to be. And that's the point of the passage. You will never grow into the Christian God wants you to be unless you have that attitude towards God's word. And it's so easy for us today to say, hey, let's make a comparison. Some of you, your attitude towards your phone and your social media is, I gotta have it. It's like your bottle. Amen, Pastor Henry. Amen. Where God's word ought to be that bottle. Some of us, our hobbies and our, uh, our television, our entertainment, that, that's our bottle. Where it ought to be God's word ought to be your bottle. He adds another word to this in this passage. He says, hey, this is your attitude. Then he expresses in the next statement, he says this. Okay, here's your appetite appetite for the word he uses the word desire that longing he's conveying the idea of longing for the bible as the baby yearns for the milk don't they make it pretty clear babies what they have an appetite for <laughs> I, I remember those days of trying to hold off a baby you know i, I remember holding a fussy baby and coming to erica and, and like she, he's hungry She's like, it's not time yet. I'm like, how can it not be time? <laughs> He's crying. <laughs> I, can't, I can't put up with this. And so, you know what we grab? We grab the pacifier. And there's a great game we play with babies. You plug it in, they plop it out. I mean, it's great. And uh, I remember early on with Reagan and Carter, they didn't have the cute little attachments that you pin to them. You know, it's kind of like that ball in the cup thing. <laughs> okay, anyway. Uh, the pacifier pops out, you stick it back in. You <laughs> I remember playing that game all the time. They're hungry. And you give them the pacifier. And uh, you ever watch the babies? I, I like to study people and so sociology and things like that. But you ever watch them? They'll taste the pacifier. I'm like, wait a second. And then, boop. I remember holding one of our babies one time. I'm like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, pop right in the face. It did not work. Why? Because they have an appetite for one thing and one thing only. An appetite. You see, my friend, if they can long for one thing like that, Peter says you and I ought to crave. We ought to long for the spiritual milk of God's word in the same way. Now listen to me carefully. This may surprise some of you. I'll be 100% transparent. That the longing, the craving for the word of God is a cultivated taste. It's a developed taste. It has to be cultivated. It's a taste that comes with exposure and, and experience to the thing we are to long for. And we'll expound a little bit in, in a moment how to cultivate this taste. But it is. Have you ever thought to yourself or had someone say to you, well, I, I don't read my Bible anymore because I just wasn't really getting much out of it. I, 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 yeah, I'm reading my Bible. I just don't get much out of it. I, I don't seem to glean. Well, let me first say this, and this is not a, to be negative, but you have to step back and analyze that from a biblical viewpoint. And the fact is this, that is more a commentary on the person than it is on the book. Okay, and that's not being unkind. It's just saying, reality is, listen, it, 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 
You ever take your children, and this is off the top of my head, so it may not work. You ever take your kids to a restaurant or something, pre-pandemic or whatever the case may be, and you're looking up at this menu board, and I remember as a kid, sometimes the restaurants only had one menu board. Now they have 58, and they're all digital. Slight baptistic exaggeration, but anyway. You ever ask your kid, what do you want? I don't know. I don't see anything. Are you kidding me? It's all that? <laughs> and, and maybe it's for you and I sometimes we're like, and I, I don't see anything I like. Now listen to me. The menu board is pretty much endless. There's something to dig into and get out. There's something you can glean. So it's not a commentary on the book, my friend. It is a commentary on the person. But beyond that, do you remember reading in the Old Testament Specifically, Psalm chapter 19 and verse 10. You remember how David described God's word, the scriptures? He said this, it is sweeter than honey in the honeycomb. Now, I'll tell you right now, I like sugar. We all like our sugar different ways. Some of you get in your coffee, some of you get in your dessert, uh, some of you get in your soft drinks, whatever the case may be. Uh, you can like sugar. Most people do. Not all everybody, but most people do. You like something that tastes sweet. Certainly, all of us would most likely like something that tastes sweet instead of bitter. And the Bible is described as being sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. But let me ask you this. Now listen. Would you know that by talking to most believers? Would you know that by watching some believers in, in their time, their attitude towards the Scriptures, assessing that and evaluating it? Would you be able to say, oh yeah, man, it's obvious that Christian views God's Word as sweeter than honey. I like how one author described it. He said there are three basic Bible students. And I like how he described them. He said the first type of Bible student is the nasty medicine type. To them, the Word of God is bitter. But it is still good for what ails them. Uh, I am grateful that in my generation, we skipped out on some of the things you older folks had to go through. As far as medicine. Drinking things and eating things. <laughs> I think my father and my mother are watching, so I'm going to tell a good story of my father. Early on when my mother was diagnosed with, diagnosed with arthritis, her joints hurt. So my father decided to be a loving husband and to go and help her because she was in a lot of pain and so forth. And so <laughs> he went to the store and he brought back some medicine he thought was medicine to help with her joints and the movements. <laughs> he, he brought back WD-40. <laughs> Needless to say, I don't think it helped, but the heart was there. I wouldn't recommend it, by the way, either. So some of you older people, you had to take castor oil, right? Take it down. This will take it. Man, oh, nasty stuff, right? I remember growing up having a sore throat and things like that. And I remember my mom saying, oh, you need a gargle of salt water. That was the worst thing ever. It helps, yes. You realize some of us, we do view God's word that way. All right, I got to read it today. I, I know it'll help me, but I just, we kind of view it as a nasty medicine. I trust that isn't your attitude today. It's a cultivated test. I, I, I agree, but it's not a nasty medicine. Number two, there's another group, and this is the shredded wheat group. <laughs> I don't like that for breakfast, but anyway, they acknowledge that the scriptures are nourishing. Yeah, it's good for you. It's good. They say, man, it's dry and boring. It's like eating a bell of hay. <laughs> it's like me eating grass. Salad without salad. Ugh. Yeah. It's that attitude of, yeah, okay. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's nourishing. It does some things, but that's just kind of dry and boring. But there's a third group that he identifies, and it's the strawberries and cream. Strawberries and cream type, they, they just can't get enough of the stuff. And it tastes so good to them. It tastes better with every bite, and I, we have some foodies in our home, and some of our children are more foodies than the others, and they got it from me, I'm sure, and, and I love when they're eating something they like, and man, between bitefuls and encouragement to talk, not to talk with their mouth full, mom, this is so good, man, we've got to have this every day. 
ah, this is why, oh, this is, you know, I mean, they, they can't get enough of it. Every bite, every time they have it, this is, this is delicious. This is what I want. This is, I mean, every time they dig in, you say, well, Pastor Henry, how do you get to be a strawberries and cream type of Bible student? It is actually simple. Don't miss it. You sit down at the table and you dig in. You sit down and you make a feast of God's word. You sit down and you taste of it every day and you'll develop a longing appetite for it. That's what Peter wants us to understand. Listen, you will develop it. It will be cultivated in you. Boy, you expose yourself to it. You experience that life-giving nourishment and nutrients. My friend, boy, you'll sit down and eat. The Bible says what? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. May I tell you the same thing is true of God's word. Oh, taste and see, but you've got to taste. You've got to sit down at the table and say, okay, you know what? This week, I'm going to read my Bible every day, and I, I, I'm going to pray and ask God to show me and illuminate my heart and my mind with things from the Word, with truth. Father, I want you to feed me today. It's essential, Lord. I need your Word in me. My friend, you sit down like that. If you will taste and see, you will see. Excuse me. If you will taste, you will see that God's Word is good. It can be strawberries and cream for you. That old prophet of the Old Testament, Jeremiah, he developed this attitude and appetite. Here's how he described it. You remember this? Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16. He says this, thy words were found, and I did eat them. I did eat them. And thy word was unto me joy and rejoicing of my heart. You cooks out there, you know it's a delight when you fix something and people can't get enough of it. Boy, it thrills your heart when they are just joyful and rejoicing over what they're taking in and what they're eating. Uh, man, may I ask you this? In, in all honesty and practicality, what type are you? Are you a nasty medicine type? Are you a shredded wheat type? Or are you a strawberries and cream when it comes to God's word? How is it for you, believer? You see, my prayer today my prayer today is that I know that there are some out here right now that are hearing my voice, maybe via live streaming even. Maybe some who will watch and listen later on. But I know there's someone and probably a good number that are, uh, have honestly never faithfully read your Bible. Not read it every day. And my prayer would be that today, you start this week, you say, you know what? I'm going to start small, small goal. The next day, between this Sunday and next Sunday, I'm going to read my Bible every day. I'm going to dig in. I, I'm going to make it a feast every day. And I, I'm going to take 10, 15, 30 minutes, and I'm going to read God's Word this week. I want to begin to cultivate that taste. Now, again, honestly, I believe in my own experience and from counseling others, it typically takes a good 20 to 30 days to cultivate a taste. And to get to that strawberries and cream point where, man, I, this is essential. I can't, I, I have that long. You know, others, I've seen it sooner. <laughs> a lot of times after someone gets saved, they just want to learn and take in. And boy, they, they realize God's word is the only place I'm going to find the answers. And so I'm turning to it. And praise the Lord if that's you. But my prayer right now for you, if you have not faithfully read and studied God's word every day, that you would dig in this week. That you make the decision in this service here in just a few moments when we have an invitation or even right now during the message that you say, you know what, that's what I'm going to do this week. There are others here that at some point in your lives, you faithfully read every day. And maybe there's been multiple times, there's been multiple seasons in, uh, in which you said, yeah, you know, I just got into God's word. But right now, you're in a time of neglecting it. Your attitude toward it is not what it should be. Your appetite, you don't long for it the way that you should. My prayer is that you would experience what I personally have experienced in some dishes of food. There have been times when maybe I've gone to a restaurant or Erica has fixed something that I hadn't had for a while. And I've sat down at the table and I've gotten that and I start to dig in and I take a, I, I take a bite. And you, you know what happens? Sometimes I think to myself, man, I forgot how good this tastes. Why haven't I been eating this more regularly? Why, why haven't I gotten this before and order this? And boy, we, we take that taste of something we've tasted a while ago, and you taste like, man, why have I not been eating this? My prayer is that for some of you this week, you haven't been faithful in God's word, but as you make it a daily practice this week, you'll be like, man, why did I ever leave it? Why did I stop eating when I needed to? 
I pray that today and the rest of this week, you'll dig into God's word again. Remember what you've been missing. Your longing will be to come back to it. Your appetite for God's word would grow within your heart and your spirit, as Peter says. But I said there are three words, so don't close your Bibles. Here's the third word, okay? Appetite, excuse me, attitude, appetite, and notice it, aim. What's the aim? What, what is the goal, the aim of studying and reading God's word? Well, he makes it clear, doesn't he? What does he say there in the passage? That we might grow thereby. Now, let me make a point. It's crucial to note it doesn't say no, K-N-O-W. Certainly, that has to happen. The, uh, but the goal of the right attitude and the right longing that brings you to the pages of the Scriptures daily is that you might grow. Obviously, you can't grow without knowing, but you most certainly can know without growing. You follow me? Yeah, certainly you can't grow without knowing, but you can know without growing. So remember this. Never forget that this wonderful book was given not to just fill our head with great facts and truth. It was not written to satisfy our curiosity or just to inform us. It is written to be an essential tool to help us be conformed to the very image of Jesus Christ. To grow into the likeness of Christ. It's not been given into our hands so that you and I would be a smarter sinner. He wants us to be a Savior-like saint. To grow. Uh, to become like Christ. It's not given to make you a pro at Bible, uh, biblical trivia. Its aim is to transform your life. Now listen to me carefully. <laughs> you ever eat too much? And it transforms your shape? It's obvious I have at times. May I tell you, you know what God's word is intended to do? Transform you. Not the outward, though it will, but not your physical shape. May I tell you what it's aimed to change? Your spiritual shape. To transform you. <laughs> Last night, my wife fixed a delicious, wonderful meal. I enjoyed it tremendously, and I, I was praising her for it, and, and she made the statement. She goes, oh, good, well, that's a keto meal. And I did. You're, you're going to have to forgive me. I wondered to myself, is this a favorite meal of the Green Lantern sidekick? That's keto, by the way. I just connected keto. To, anyway, I don't know why this brain works that way, but that's what I thought. I'm like, what? What is she talking about, Keto. She goes on, she goes, she probably saw the very bewildered, ignorant look on my face. She goes, that means it's a, it's a meal that, that, that encourages and produces fat burning. And immediately I'm like, wow. I like meals that burn fat that don't make me fat. That's the kind of meal I like that. And it tasted good. This is awesome. Now, I thought about that for a moment. In fact, I was going over my message then after that and working on it. And I was like, man, can I tell you? Every spiritual meal is much the same way. Oh, it's not going to burn fat, though I wish it did. But you know what every meal in God's Word does? It helps to eradicate sin, burn sin out of us if we allow it to. But my friend, you know what its intent is to, in doing that even, is to build us into the very likeness of Christ. To grow us. I like that thought. You should not skip a meal of God's word if it has the aim of growing you and me. It does something for you. Is it really essential? Can you honestly say, oh yeah, I believe God's word is essential, but yet you skip it? Why would you skip that? My question for you is this as we close. Are you growing up? Are you growing up? This is the aim, and it is a product of the right attitude and the right appetites, and it's a product of saying God's word is essential. At, are you growing up? Now, somewhere maybe in your house or maybe grandparents a long time ago you had this, but maybe somewhere in your house you have marked on a door frame or a piece of wood the height of your children. And every so often they'll come and say, hey, measure me, measure me. And you do it there and you mark, they make that little mark. And, and uh, you see that and, and maybe you have stopped when they've gotten older and so forth. Now, for us, we don't use a door frame. We don't use a piece of wood. My teenagers go to my wife. 
Look, Mom, I'm taller than you. That's how you measure now. The other day, look, Dad, I'm taller than Mom, or I'm catching Mom. So that becomes the new measuring stick. Someday it's going to be me, amen? I'll be the measuring stick. We measure, hey, they're growing up, boy. They're, they're, they're growing up. It's often depressing to me because we've all, many of us, have reached that age where we stop growing up, amen? And if we were going to measure, the lines would be ver uh, horizontal, not vertical. But anyway, we aren't going to go there. Right now, unfortunately, we're facing what? Growing older and out. <laughs> but let me ask you this. Are you just growing old? Or are you growing up spiritually? Because that ought to never stop. You may be 40, 50, 60, 70. But when it comes to God's word, you ought to be like a newborn babe. And you ought to be desiring that milk and the meat. And you ought to be growing up. Put it this way. Where do you measure on God's growth chart? You say, what is that? Where, where's God's growth chart? Where, where can I see that? That's the image of Jesus Christ. How are you like Christ? Your responses, your actions, all of these things. I leave you with this summation. See, the aim is growth. Bible reading, Bible study, the aim is growth. And the essential, if it's essential, it means of hitting what we are aiming at. To essentially do that, yeah, you got to get in God's word. you got to have to have the right attitude and right appetite. And I just simply ask you this past week, did you? Are you? Maybe this morning as we head in this invitation, it's going to, Holy Spirit's pricking and knocking on the door of your heart and say, listen, friend, come back to the dinner table. Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, let's not meet, let's not miss the dinner table time. Let's not meet eating together and feeding together. You come and I'll feed you. I almost entitled this message simply this. God in heaven calling to you and I saying, may I have a moment? Can I talk to you a moment? Does he? Will you this week? What's your attitude? What's your appetite for? Are you longing like a newborn babe, desiring the sincere milk of the word?